Hallo Leofgemeente Riversdal, it's wonderful to be together with you, thanks to technology. Greetings to you and your homes, wherever you're watching from, or maybe you stumbled across this on the internet. Uh, from, uh, our greetings come from East London, in the Eastern Cape. Our church is praying for you, please pray for us. And uh, it's wonderful to be together. We love your pastors, Simon and Yanni. They're wonderful human beings, community members, parents, and um, they've been a real encouragement. And your church has been an inspiration to us from, from a distance. Maybe you didn't know that. Just the way that you're influencing and impacting your community, your vision for uh, racial integration and reconciliation and justice and uh, for reaching people who have never been in church or have given up on church because they've been to church. And it's just wonderful to, to, to be connected with you. Uh, your, your leaders are wonderful leaders and you should support them with whole hearts. You can have confidence in them. You're privileged to be led by people like that. Well, I want to begin today's message with a story, a hiking story. I have a lot of hiking stories because my, my family actually grew up in the mountains, uh, going off into the mountains. And my dad relays a hiking story where he was leading a party that was going right up to the top of the mountains in uh, the in the Drakensberg Mountains in the in Guazul Natal, and if you know anything about that mountain range, if you're hiking up to the what they call the escarpment, the highest point, you're going to spend the last four or five hours of the day doing really hard work. You're in a very steep, rocky gully, um, sheer cliffs on both sides. You're climbing over huge boulders, and uh, it's very hard work with a heavy rucksack. And so, naturally, what happens? in a time like that is the party kind of divides into parts. And in this case, it had formed a slower group that was stopping and resting and just plodding, taking their time, and a faster group of fitter people who had made it right to the top. And so in the early hours of the afternoon, the fit group was sitting on top of the mountain and they said, uh, I'm sure that the slower group will join us shortly. And they sat there, they made some afternoon tea and looked at the incredible view Time went on, they pitched their tents, and they thought, well, the group's probably just having a tough day, you know. Maybe someone's rolled their ankle, and they're struggling a little bit, and, or they had to take an extra rest. And They made supper, and they washed the dishes, and then the sun had gone down, and they were getting into bed, and they thought, you know what? Something must have happened to these people. And so they said, oh, let's give it another 45 minutes, and they sat there, and they waited, and they said, no, listen, something bad has happened here. We better go down. And they got ready. They thought, we're going to find someone with a broken leg, someone who's been bitten by a snake, or perhaps this party has got badly lost, taken a wrong turn, or there's some other kind of massive disaster. So they put on a rucksacks, and they took extra food and medical supplies, and they were ready with this rescue party. And they went down the pass, and maybe not even 40 or 50 meters down the pass, they found these tents pitched on an angle like this. And... This party had stopped so short from the top. And they lit, my dad describes it like this, where they opened the zip of the tent, people literally rolled out because the, the incline was so steep. And they said to them, why did you stop so close to the top? And they said, well, we couldn't see the top. And we thought to ourselves, there's too much work. This is, we just can't keep moving. We're going to have to sleep a night to finish this day. You know, that's what life is like. So often we, we, we stop so close to our destination or just before a breakthrough because we can't see the top and we just need some encouragement. I want to read to you Philippians chapter 3 and verse 11 to 14. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love this passage of scripture because it says that God has taken hold of us and we must take hold of that for which God has taken hold of us. There needs to be a two-way taking hold. Did you know, maybe this is news to you if you're not sure if you're a Christian or trying to figure out what this is all about. Maybe you grew up around religion, but you've never known who Jesus is. Here's the, here's the short story of it. 
God wasn't happy for us to be separate from him. He came down in the person of Jesus Christ, put on flesh. He died for our sin on the cross. He was raised from the dead um, three days later. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and he poured out his spirit. And now by his spirit, he is taking hold, even of you today. This is him saying, I've got a plan for your life and, and I want your life to to be counted for my kingdom. I want you to be in my family. I want you to be part of this mission that I have on the earth. And he invites us to take hold of it. We must also take hold of him to live out his plans and his purposes in the mess, in the suffering, in the difficulty, in the complexity. We must take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. Praise God, he always holds us much tighter than we hold him. But I want to talk to you this morning about taking hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of you. I want to talk to you about not giving up. I want to talk to you about pressing on. And I wonder, uh, I wonder why so often um, people stop just short of a breakthrough of a moment that is going to push them into a whole different trajectory in life. God's will is that we would be everything that he desires us to be and that we would fulfill his plan on the earth in every way. There's an assignment for you. There's a purpose for you individually and as a church, in your place of work, in your family, in your community, in South Africa as a whole. Let me talk about some things that stop us from pressing forward. And uh, the title of my message is Moving Forward. Number one, grief and regret. This is a big one. And you know, it, during, even during this coronavirus period, this has become something very real for us. Um, here in the Eastern Cape, uh, maybe as many as 8,000 people have lost their lives, um, probably attributed most of those to, to the coronavirus pandemic. In many parts of South Africa, it's not, uh, hasn't been so serious. Uh, one lady in our church, it's, she lost six people in her family to the coronavirus. And so grief and regret, um, it, it, when someone dies, you know, we, we look at that very, very seriously. It stares us right in the face. But in, in, in other ways, we grieve as well. You know, you, the loss of a job is real grief. The change of a relationship is, is real grief. Perhaps during this pandemic and in other ways, we grieve the, the loss of a way of life. As a pastor, one of the things that I've had to struggle with is just the loss of what church looks like and not being able to be with people. I miss being able to hug people. I miss being able to connect with people over a cup of coffee. And some of those things are coming back soon. But what I'm saying to you is that grief and regret doesn't mean that there's, this has to be this massive loss in your life. We experience it in many ways. Perhaps I'm talking to you about not being able to complete your education or a project or a goal that you had or a business indicator that you were hoping would perform a certain way. Perhaps I'm talking to you about a relationship that was important to you. We suffer grief and regret, and it stops us from moving forward. And you know, so often the language that is spoken when someone is in a place of grief or regret is, come on, let's just move on. Come now, you, it's been three months, can you just move on? It's been six months, you can, just, can you just move on? Or that's in the past, just move on. You know, the reality is we never just move on. But what we can do is we can move forward. If you're experiencing grief and regret, you may feel very angry about something. You may be wanting to try and explain it. You may even be angry with God. You may feel depressed at times. You may have good days and bad days. You may have ups and downs. And uh, you may feel sometimes that you've lost so much you just can't carry on. And the good news about Jesus is that he's not unkind. He doesn't say, oh, can you just move on? He says, let me come into this place of grief and regret with you, into your place of anger, perhaps at times denial, depression, whatever the case may be, and let me help you move forward. And what happens in this process, if you invite Jesus into that place, is he just helps you to live life in a new way, one step at a time. And that grief, that pain, that injury, that injustice, whatever it is, maybe somebody did something to you, it never stops being part of your story, but it does heal and it becomes a part of your story in a way that's redemptive. And so a wound closes and becomes a scar. And when I look at a scar, it's a story of healing. And so Jesus comes into our lives with his kindness and his healing. And, and maybe my encouragement to you today can just be, don't force yourself to try and move on. Just 
allow Jesus to help you to move forward one step at a time. Get up and do something towards your purpose, towards your goals. It might not be as fast. You may never be okay with what you've lost. You may never have this moment and, you know, you may never have this moment of, oh, this is what it means or this is what God was doing. God may never show up and be like, this is why it happened to you. You may never get that kind of, of satisfaction until eternity. But what you can do is you can keep moving forward and trust that God is good. And you need to say, my purpose is greater than my pain. And the promise that's on my life is more important than the burden that I carry. I must keep moving forward. And in that place, Jesus will visit you as long as it takes and you can make progress. Can you say amen to that? Another way that perhaps we are prevented from moving forward is because of guilt and condemnation. I don't know about you, but I often have moments where I look at what I'm facing in front of me and I say, I'm not the right person for this. I'm not smart enough for this. My leadership is not strong enough for this. I'm not connected enough for this. I don't, I'm the wrong person. God, I'm not doubting you, I'm doubting me. <laughs> and Sometimes I fail in ways that make me think, why did I even try and do something good in the first place? And you know, a sense of guilt and condemnation can really stop us from moving forward. And, and I want to ask you this, just a simple practical question, which I have to ask myself when I get to places like that. And it happens to me sometimes in cycles. I have to say to myself, if I'm not the right person for this, why did God give it to me to do? Why didn't he give it to someone else? You know, just the fact that you have what you have is a message from God. It's a call from God. Your family, your church, your neighborhood, your place of work, your community, these are gifts from God. And the fact that you're doing what you're doing is a call from God. The needs around you are a call from God. And He always finishes what He starts. And so we need to, you know, this is the thing. We give up not on God, but on ourselves, we, we don't be, stop believing that God is good and God is glorious and God is strong and God has promises and God has a vision and he wants to tear down the kingdom of darkness and bring uh, you know, justice and righteousness on the earth. We don't give up on those things. We just don't believe that it can happen through us. And it's amazing how the devil comes and he says to us in those moments, not you've done something bad, but you are bad. Not you've done something wrong or you took a wrong turn, but you are wrong. You're on the wrong direction. You're the wrong person. It always becomes a case of our identity. And that is, you know, the devil knows how to, how to play on our need to be justified by what we do. Um, and here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus didn't die for us because we're strong and capable people. He died for us on the cross because we're weak and we fail God in a thousand, in a thousand different ways. And so, you know, when Jesus speaks to us, it's always with this voice of conviction. He, he says, this is where you are. This is what went wrong. This is how you can move forward. Let me get into this with you and let me help you. Let me carry you when you feel like you're not strong enough. Uh, and, and let me help you move forward. The devil always speaks words of condemnation. The Holy Spirit speaks words of conviction and encouragement. And uh, so if you're struggling with guilt and condemnation, I want you to receive afresh the grace of God. You know, Jesus died for you on the cross. Don't give up on yourself because Jesus hasn't given up on you. He hung on the cross all the way until he gave up his spirit and he was in the grave and he had to be raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. He went through all of that because he saw the image of God in you. If you've given up on you, Jesus hasn't given up on you and learn to quickly allow yourself to receive the forgiveness that Jesus wants to give you so that you can keep moving forward. Amen. Another reason that sometimes I think we, we give up um, or we, we don't keep moving forward is, is burnout and tiredness. Tiredness and burnout. You know, I think we all go through this cycle where we apply, we aim for something, we apply ourselves to it, we've got, been given a burden to carry, whether by choice or not, and we push through those things and we become tired, and, and then we rest and we become refreshed and we go back into the work again, into carrying it again. And that's normal sort of tiredness and rest and recovery. It's kind of healthy tired. But then there comes a point where you get so depleted that you start to feel down, where you're so 
sapped, de-energized, that you feel like you wonder why you even were doing anything good in the first place. You fail to dream. You start to see problems as being bigger than they are. You perhaps become really angry or mean towards the people that, that are depending on you for love and kindness and support. And even the people that are helping you, you shut them out. And this is a place called burnout. And I want to talk to you about this because uh, I, I thought about this phrase. Maybe it helps you. Tiredness comes from the conditions around you, but burnout comes from the expectations within you. Tiredness comes from the condition around you, and it's normal. But burnout comes from unmanaged or poorly managed or false or wrong expectations that you have within you of yourself or of other people. And, 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 and so I have to ask myself this question. You know, this is, this is what I, do, I find myself doing. I can create a person that I feel like I'm supposed to be or set myself goals that I feel like I'm supposed to achieve or else. And then when I fail to be that person or fail to achieve those goals, I say I'm a bad person. And, 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 and so I'm failing at being something I was never supposed to be. <laughs> so as I analyze myself, I find that I'm often creating in my mind, in my heart, what the Bible calls an idol. This picture of myself that gives me dignity, meaning, value, and worth. And it's not from the love of Jesus. that I can, I'm supposed to be getting those things from the love of Jesus and from being made in the image of God and being a child in his house. But I'm starting to use other things to make myself feel good about myself. And, and I have to identify those things because those are the things that I know really wear me out. You know, when Jesus comes into your life, of course, he brings all kinds of dreams and aspirations for you. He actually stretches you and pushes you outside of your comfort zone in many different ways. But here's the thing about Jesus. When you serve him and you have the sense of obedience to him, when you fail, he forgives you. But when you create this idol for yourself, this picture of, of success, and it's, and it's all about you and measuring yourself and feeling good, attaching yourself worth to it, when you fail that, it crushes you. And you feel like you can't move on. And so let me just ask you, are you pinning your sense of self-worth to something and causing yourself to burn out? If you feel like depressed and fatigued and just angry and lost your vision and you don't know where you're going or you, you, you don't know why you're doing what you're doing and maybe even giving up on your faith or maybe you're saying, I don't even know if I want to come back to church. Any of those things, maybe ask yourself if it's not to do with the conditions around you, but perhaps to do with some expectations that you have within you. Another way that we uh, get stuck is, is through doubt. And, you know, doubt is, uh, I'm talking about doubting what you believe. And, you know, doubt is one of those things that can stop us from moving forward. And here's the thing, I don't believe that we doubt uh, and take ourselves away from faith. I believe we doubt ourselves towards faith when we doubt properly. You know, Thomas was a guy who doubted properly. Everyone calls him Doubting Thomas because when Jesus was raised from the dead, Thomas didn't get to see him like all the other disciples. And he said, well, if I actually see his hands and his feet, then I'll believe. And uh, let me tell you something about Thomas. When he, when he doubted and doubted and stuck around until he actually saw Jesus, he, he went to India all by himself. And he was the first Christian, Christian missionary, we think, to India and planted thousands of churches and was actually martyred for his faith there. So he wasn't a guy who was a scaredy cat or who had a half faith. He just wanted to push through and to see some things happen um, in, in, with regards to his faith. Um, I, I was in a building the other day and um, I leaned on a fence that I'd leaned on many times and the fence fell over. And what had happened was during lockdown, uh, when we inspected this fence, the, it had slowly been eroding at the bottom of the fence, been rusting. Someone had taken a shortcut and used just some very cheap materials. And you know, this is the thing. We, it looked fine for months. I saw that fence, I saw that fence, but when I leaned on it, I realized it couldn't take my weight. This is what the coronavirus pandemic has done for a lot of people. It's caused a lot of people to say, sure, my Christian faith, can I, can I depend on it for this? You know, and you never realize how important your faith is and what you believe is until you have to lean on it. It's raised some questions for people. Perhaps having suffered grief and loss, you've asked questions about the goodness of God. How can there be so much suffering in the world and, and God is still good and powerful? In recent times, the Black Lives Matter movement has asked, forced us to ask questions. 
about what justice and reconciliation look like for the people of God in this life and why we've managed to ignore those things. And where is Jesus in that? You know, there's many, many, many questions that suffering causes us to ask. And my encouragement to you is don't let those questions become stumbling blocks to you. Don't let those moments of doubt become places that prevent you from moving forward in your faith. Use that to doubt yourself towards Jesus. Dig into the answers, search the scriptures, ask questions, wrestle with it, pray fast until you get something that's satisfactory. And I believe that the person of Jesus Christ, his witness, his resurrection from the dead, and everything that's recorded in the Holy Scriptures, which we call the Bible, that is sufficient answer and it's going to give you something robust and may you use this moment of doubt to develop a fence that doesn't fall over something that's sturdy and substantial that can carry the weight of your soul and a vision that is worthy of living for in society in jesus name so we don't doubt away from faith we doubt towards faith when we doubt with jesus i i I thought i hope that those thoughts are encouraging to you and I want to, to close with a story. Um, and, and, and really, the, the, before I tell you that story, you know, how do we live in this way? We have to do it in community. It, how do you deal with grief and regret? You've got to get people around you, help you get perspective. How do you deal with condemnation? You need people to affirm you, give you, give you perspective. If you have wrong expectations of yourself, you only really see yourself properly when you're in community. Um, if you have doubts, you bring those doubts into the community and you talk about it in community. Everything is solved with community. I recently had a conversation with our elders that just turned me around, you know. Um, and and it, 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 two hours earlier before that conversation, I, I was so distressed and I was so in pain and I was so stuck. And at the end of the conversation, I was like, how could I see myself so wrongly? How could I see God so wrongly? How could I have been stuck and not seen these possibilities? You need community if you're going to keep moving forward. So let me end with this story. Uh, another hiking story. And uh, this time I w- I'm in the Alps. And I-, I had the amazing opportunity to go through the, the Alps for some weeks. And um, we were in this expedition where we were about to have a big day. Uh, it was going to be a three-day trip. And I was preparing the night before, um, stuffing my, my sleeping bag. And I was leaning back on my knee, and I have this rugby injury. Uh, yes, I played rugby. I don't know why. I'm too skinny to play rugby. And I had this rugby injury, old rugby injury in my knee. And as I leant back, I pushed a piece of cartilage out of my knee into just the wrong place. And I just knew instantly tomorrow is going to be a very tough day. And so I went to the leader of the expedition and I said, I don't want any pity. I'm going to be all right, but I'm just going to keep going the whole day. I'm not going to stop. Don't ask how I'm doing. Just, just wait for me until I get to the top. Make sure I get to the top. And so the next day came and I put on my rucksack and the party would go and they'd stop and they'd eat and they'd drink and they'd laugh and they'd rest and I'd walk past them. And then they'd catch me up and pass me and they'd stop and they'd eat and they'd drink and they'd laugh and they'd rest and I'd walk past them. And five or six hours went by like this, in a lot of pain, limping every step of the way. And I got to the bottom of this, this uh, rock spire, the mountain hut that we were staying in, is the bottom of this rock spire, and it's maybe about 100 meters. Um, so we've got to about 4,000 meters now. And the last 100 meters is very steep ice. And so I get my rucksack off, and I put my crampons on, and I reach for my ice axe that was strapped on the back of my rucksack, and it's not there. And I can't carry on this expedition. The next day is all on the glacier, going into, into Switzerland from, from the Italian border side, and I, I have to get this ice axe. I must have dropped it somewhere on the path. So I turn around, and I go back down. And I find this ice axe has dropped at about 2,000 meters. So I went all the way down to 2,000 meters. I almost did the whole day twice. And you know what? It was an incredibly tough day, but I made it to the top with a limp, because I just kept moving forward. Let me tell you something. You might have a limp. 
You might have some regrets, you might have some pain, you might have some failures, but if you just keep moving forward, don't worry about the limp, you'll get to the top. Don't stop short of taking hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of you. Someone in your world is counting on you to keep moving forward. Lief Gemeente, your community is counting on you to keep moving forward. Our country is counting on people like you to keep moving forward. So whatever your difficulties, whatever your challenges, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Keep moving forward in Jesus' name.